delighted to see every one of you. What I believe we are going to learn is actually so simple, I can teach you in five minutes, honestly. And you will see how simple it is. However, to explain and really for it to sink in, it takes time. Just like when you want to have fish fry, what do you do? You put the masala and then you fry it right away, correct? What do you do? You marinate it. That's when the taste comes. Today, the things that we are going to talk about, the texts we are going to look at, none of them are heavy theological texts, meaning where our faith will shake because of that. <coughs> like that. But let me tell you, some of them are not so heavy, but still we have our views maybe challenged a little bit by your own looking at your own Bible. Not my Bible, your Bible. Okay? So I'm going to push you. What you're going to look at is... Let me summarize. Is that a difficult diagram to understand? Is that difficult? That's all. That's all we're going to learn today. But what those A, B, C, et cetera are, we will see. All right? That's what we're going to learn today when we deal with the text of Scripture. Apples, bananas, and coconuts. And some of you are wondering, what is all this? Right? Well, one thing is, it is A, B, C. The first thing we are going to look at, what is the purpose of this seminar? It is to remind us that there is a need for responsible interpretation of the Bible. The Bible is not my word, it's God's word. And God's people through the centuries have been using this. And we as pastors and preachers and teachers have to learn how to use it responsibly. Now all of us do that. But you know, the basic principle is very simple. Uh, we all know it, but many times without us knowing it, in unintentionally, we do what we know we should not do. So we know some basic principles of interpretation, but we sometimes miss it because of default settings that we have. Quickly, next. We're going to gain confidence that if we are careful with reading scripture, we can understand the basic message of the Bible. The good news is we all know how to interpret. Even a five-year-old girl, okay, when the mother calls the girl, the girl knows why the mother is. So she knows by the tone of the voice, the context, everything. We all know how to interpret. I'm not going to teach you how to interpret. I'm only going to remind you, don't forget what you already know. Next. But the bad news is that our interpretations are not always correct or accurate or consistent. That's why we get married. So that we learn we are not always right. Okay, some of us are learning, some of us are struggling with learning that. Okay, in other words, we are not always right in our interpretations. It's possible. Uh, we can be confident and be wrong. Uh, so we need to realize that. Next, quickly. This is an interesting verse. In Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says, Man shall not wear women's clothing, women shall not wear man's clothing, for it, the Lord detests this. Right? Are you familiar with this verse? 41 years ago, I discovered this verse my pastor told us. And he told us that women should not wear trousers. So this question is, is it okay for Christian women to wear trousers? Do you know if some people will say not to wear? Christian women should not wear? Do you think? Yes? Are there churches where Christian women do wear trousers? Yes or no? Yes. In Bangalore itself. So what do we do with this verse? Next. What do we do with this verse? 11.7 7 says, don't eat pork meat. Don't eat crabs, don't eat prawns. This is in scripture. Your Bible also eh? is there. So what do we do with this? Does it apply to us? It's in your Bible. Do we follow everything in the Bible? Good question, right? Next. Everybody knows this verse. What is Philippians 4.13? I can do, come on. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What does it mean? What did Paul say by that? What does it mean? Next. Deuteronomy 22, verse 9 to 11, there are three verses there. And one verse says, don't mix two kinds of seed in the vineyard, grape seeds. 
Another verse says, don't wear clothes of wool and linen mixed together. Okay? Uh, and then the third one says, don't plow with an ox and a donkey. Why did God tell the Israelites not to do that? Good question. Why not an ox and a donkey yoked together? Why? Why can't we do Suppose I only have an ox and one donkey. Can't I plow my field with that? Why does God tell them not to do that? Next. Mark 10, 25, Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What is Jesus saying? Some of us have said or heard that, uh, oh, there was a gate in Jerusalem that was a small gate that somehow you can push the camel through if he takes off all the load and all. Have you heard that? Yes, that is what some of us have heard. Only problem with that is there was no gate in the time of Jesus like that. A few centuries later, somebody built a, a door and a gate and called it the needle side gate. Interesting. So what is Jesus saying? Next, Proverbs 22 verse 28 says, Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your ancestors. Sometimes that verse is used to say, We have a Pentecostal tradition. Don't change it. Do not move an ancient boundary stone. So the question is, is a stone a stone? Is it customs or traditions that, or practices we have followed, let's say, as Pentecostals or whatever? What is this verse about? Next. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Don't you know that you are the uh, temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? If you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you. What is the temple of God? Which is the temple? Yeah, we. We meaning we or individual. So that's the question. Is it that individual I, my body, is the body the temple or is it the church the temple? Good question. Next, Revelation 13, 18. You remember that verse? It's a number of the beast and his number is 666. Who's 666? According to what the WhatsApps you have received, who's 666? Come on, tell me. We have a lot of people who have been called 666, correct? Would you like to have a number 666 on your car? I think you would not. Right? What is this 666? Who is this 666? Yes, next. Revelation 14, 20 says, And the blood of the judgment will come so high that it will be at the height of the horse's bridle light in that image. And it will flow for 1600 stadia. The equivalent of 1600 is about 300 kilometers. That is from Bangalore to Chennai. So just think about human blood at this height flowing from Bangalore to Chennai. Should we expect this as a literal flow of blood? Or is there some other way to understand this verse? Next. Genesis 24, well-known story to find a bride for Isaac. What does Abraham do? He sends Eliezer to find. So what do we learn about God? He finds Rebecca, correct? And uh, it's a wonderful story. What do we learn about God from here? And how does it apply to us? These are questions. Um, Revelation 21. Will we walk on streets of gold in heaven? Yes or no? Yes? Very good. That's a good answer, by the way. Not the correct answer. But it's a good answer. You will all give good answers. I mean, then we will look at what is the correct answer. That's a different point. Okay. So we have, we have songs about that. You know, we will walk on the streets that are golden. I like that song. I still sing it. But the question is, is that what we're going to walk in heaven? You know, here we are to walk on in dirty streets and this and that. And there we'll walk on gold. And some of us have even said, why do you want to put gold here and there? We will be walking on gold, brother. That's another interesting argument. Let's go on next slide. Um, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Where is that? John 15. Now, what do we do with that? Why did he say that? Why did he not say, I'm the true mango? Why did he say, I'm the true vine? Yes? Next. 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16. That's an interesting passage where clearly Paul tells the Corinthian women in the first century and all the Greek churches, he says, women in public worship must 
have their head covered. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Very clear. Paul is very clear about the Corinthian women and he says, I have no other rule for all the Gentile churches in the Greek world. Question is, what about it today? Is it compulsory for all Christian women in public worship, whether they are in Brazil or they are in Boston or they are in Bombay or they are in Beijing in China? Is it compulsory? Does that passage deal? This is an application question. Interpretation, all of us will agree, that's what Paul told them. Question is about application, not interpretation. Application today, does it apply to all Christian women everywhere? And we realize we are not agreed on that. We realize that. There is no Assemblies of God rule about it. There is no Assemblies of God rule about this. And sometimes in the same Assemblies of God church, one congregation, the English congregation, will have a different rule. But in the vernacular congregation, not rule as much as a practice. Correct? Some pastors are very strict. They will say, if you don't want to cover your heads, don't come to my church. That is also possible. What do we do with application? In 1 Corinthians 11, there are two problems that Paul deals with, not one. What is the second problem in chapter 11? It's something to do with the Lord's table. What is the problem in the Lord's table there? Most of us, when we use that section for the Lord's table, we read from verse 24. What I received from the Lord, the Lord I gave to you. None of us ever in our communion service reads from the verse 17 onwards. But the context of that passage is in verse 17 onwards, where some people are gathering in the home. Please understand, Lord's table is not what you and I do on Sunday. And what did we do? We ate a small piece of bread and a this much of grape juice. That's not what is happening in the Lord's table. We are doing very symbolic. That time they actually ate a meal. And what happened was they would meet in the house of a rich man, a villa. And the rich people would come together and eat seven or eight of them. And eat and eat and drink so much that they were drunk. And then when the poor came, there was not enough good food for them. That was the poor were being humiliated. The problem was the poor were being humiliated in the church. And we don't know about that passage. We only are taken up with the first part. You read carefully, there are two problems, and you try to listen to the tone of Paul's voice. You will be surprised. Yes, Paul does tell the women in the first section, you have to cover your heads there. But listen to how he speaks about the second issue. He's angry about the second issue. He's not so worried about in comparison about the first issue. We are more upset about the first issue, and we don't even know about the second issue. Interesting. Let's read on. Go on. Yes. Uh, John 2, 4, Jesus called his mother, woman. Isn't that rude? What do you think? Was it rude? How does it say in Tamil? What is it Tamil? It's 3A. Malayalam. 3A. Telugu. Amma, interesting. Kannada. Amma, interesting. So what is happening here? We need to understand about Bible translation. Jesus was not speaking in Malayalam, or Tamil, or Telugu, or Kannada. Jesus spoke in Aramaic, and the gospel is written in Greek. So translation is not an always easy business. It's a tricky business. All of you know that. Sometimes when we have a preacher and one more translation, and if you know both the languages, sometimes you'll say, Ayo, the, the interpreter did not get it. It's not easy. Translation is not easy. Next. John 10, 22, it says there, the feast of dedication came. Which feast is this? Which feast is there? What is this feast of dedication? 10, 22 says the feast of dedication came. Anyone? Temple dedication. Which temple dedication? Jerusalem temple dedication, okay. That's a good answer. First Kings, that's a good guess. Not correct. But there is some truth in what he just now said. Let's go on. Matthew 6.33 said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. All these things refers to what? Huh? Food. What else? Clothing. What else? Shelter also? Okay. Check that out. Read that Matthew 6. There is no mention of shelter. <laughs> Only food and clothing is mentioned. 
Shelter is not one of those mentioned all these things in that context, right? Let's go on. Next. I'm going fast. John 10, 10 a. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What is the second part? But I have come to give you life more abundantly. Who's the thief? Satan. Correct? That's a good answer. Not the right answer. <laughs> We're going to see. We're going to see. All right. Let's go on. This is a verse we use. When two or three gather in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When do we normally use this verse? When we have a prayer meeting with seven people. When 500 people are there, do we use this verse? Yes or no? Normally not. Because Jesus then has to come, you know. 500 people are there. 5,000 people are there. But seven or eight, we comfort ourselves and say, where two or three? Gather in my name. Why is that verse there? What is the meaning of this verse? Let's go on. A lily of the valley, a rose of Sharon. Who is the lily of the valley? Rose of Sharon. We have that also, church, denomination, all that. What is this verse about? Or who is this verse about? Who is this? Lover. Yes. Who? The male lover or the female lover? Interesting. We will look at that. Next. Sincere Christians can and do come to different interpretations of the same biblical text. You see, we have different interpretations, not because one is more sincere and the other one is not. Among sincere Christians, we have different interpretations. And we often tend to, why is it, why is it that we have different interpretations? I use a language from computers. Because we have default settings. In other words, all of us, have ways of thinking that we have developed. Or we were told this is the meaning of that. So it's kind of a default setting like in, in your device or in a computer. It's a default setting. So we start with that. When we hear that, that's what we think. Okay. Next. It is not easy to agree on the present application of the text. Even when we agree on the interpretation of the text. I give you two examples. Pork. Eating pork. There are sincere Pentecostal Christians who enjoy eating pork. And there are sincere Pentecostal Christians who will say you should not eat pork. And I still remember many years ago I had an African student, Nigerian student in my class. And when we asked about can Christians eat pork, he said, no. He was a big man, Donatus. And I said, why Donatus? Why can't we eat pork? He said, Jesus cast the demons into the pigs. You know what the next guy sitting beside him said? Okay, Brother Donatus, we will not eat those pigs. Are you getting it? We don't agree. We all agree on the interpretation. That is, the Israelites were told not to eat these kind of things. Right? We all agree on that. But we don't agree on the, on the application today. So that's the difference. Sometimes we will agree on the interpretation, but can, does it apply to us today? Uh, maybe not. Oh, yes. That's the challenge. There is a great need to discern between literal and non-literal uses of words. In other words, when you look at a word in the scripture, should we take this as literally or literary? Meaning uh, metaphorically, not literal. So stone, is it a stone or is stone a metaphor? I have given you some references there. Ephesians 2.20. Jesus is called the chief cornerstone. Is he a stone? Is Jesus a stone? No. So it's a metaphorical use of that language. So we have to figure out when it is. Psalm 22. The bulls of Bashan. Who are the bulls of Bashan? Are they real bulls? Is the psalmist actually in a bullfighting arena? No. So what is he talking about? What is Bashan? Bashan is a place where the bulls are very strong bulls. And so what the psalmist is saying, I have great enemies, big, huge fellows, not ordinary fellows. So he's using the words, not bulls are not real bulls. So just because it says bulls doesn't mean real bulls. So we have to discern. Sometimes when you're reading the scripture, the word is to be taken literally, other times as a literary writing, it's metaphorical. So maybe the river of blood, is it necessary that we should think of it as human blood flowing at this height from Chennai to Bangalore that far? Good question. Next. We are to remember that sometimes just understanding a biblical text, 
just being sincere is not sufficient. Sincerity alone is not a guarantee that our understanding of scripture is right. Next, we have to study other things. It's important to be consistent with the respect of use of biblical texts. I have given a couple of examples. I'm going a little fast. I need to, otherwise I'll not finish. Women be silent. Ah, that is one of the passages that is used in some churches. And uh, interestingly, some churches don't allow women even to pray in from the front. And forget about preaching. And, but interest, they take that from 1 Corinthians 14. But what does 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14 talk about? What does 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14 talk about? Spiritual gifts. So while this church says women cannot pray even in public, they also, they pull out from chapter 14, but then they say we don't believe in spiritual gifts. That is an example of lack of consistency. All right, let's go on. Recognize the reality of the Bible translations which are involved in the difficult task of interpretation. Bible translation is not easy, okay? And when you're reading it in a vernacular, your Bible, don't just remind yourself Jesus did not speak in Tamil or Malayalam. Translators, they are working hard and trying to do their best that they can. But translation is not always easy. And just by knowing words, you cannot translate just by knowing words. So there was a story of John Maxwell. One of his books was translated into Tamil. Okay, John Maxwell is an American leadership guy. So in that, it says that somebody had hot dog. And it was translated into Tamil. Now, what is a hot dog? It's not nai. It is not kutta. It is a sandwich. But the dear translator knew hot and he knew dog. So he translated it as shudan nai kari. And without editing, it was printed. Translation is tricky business. When you're reading a translation, remind yourself about that. Jesus did not call his mother Strie. Why? Give me a good reason. Why? He was not speaking in Malayalam. Right? He was not speaking in Malayalam or Tamil or Telugu or whatever. He said something in Aramaic and the gospel writer is writing in Greek. And the word gunai in Greek comes from the noun gune, from where you get gynecology. Gunai in the Greek culture, you can respectfully call your mother Gunai, which is, sounds like madam. But the problem comes when you translate into Malayalam, Tamil, it sounds like 3A. Why? If you don't talk to your mother disrespectfully, why will Jesus do that? So remind yourself. So I, that's why I like the Telugu and Kannada translation, Amma. No problem. Because they're trying to bring the respect. How do you do that? Biblical interpretation or translation of the Bible is tricky business. You need to understand that. Okay, there is something more about Bible translation. It's about manuscripts. Many, many people don't understand that. You need to understand that translations are done from manuscripts that are available. And today we have better uh, translations because we have access to earlier manuscripts. Numbers are symbolic in the Bible. Yeah, you can tell me, why is it 420 is a number for fraud? The Indian Penal Code, IPC, not Indian Pentecostal Church, Indian Penal Code, number 420 talks about the fraud. So numbers become symbolic. So maybe 666 also is something symbolic in that culture. Now the American does not know the meaning of 420, but the street boy in Bombay knows, how come? Because he knows what it is used in that context, culture. But the American who's educated doesn't know about that context. That's why he doesn't know what is 420. If only we know about what is happening in the first century context, we know the meaning of 666 then. It is not fair to say, God told me. Don't say that I'm reading the Bible. God told me the meaning is this. Because then we have a problem. God told, tells this person the meaning is this, but he also tells this person the meaning is this, and they are two different meanings. Now, what do we do? How do we decide between two people, both claiming God told them? Be very careful before you say God told me, especially when you're interpreting the Bible. I fasted 40 days. Good. That's a good thing. 
But that doesn't mean after that, whatever you say is right. Not necessarily. All right, let's go on. What is the Bible? The Bible is a human, divine, written word of God. While we say the Bible is a word of God, who wrote it? Who wrote Galatians? Who wrote the Psalms? Not all the Psalms, some of the Psalms. David, yeah, some of them, and different people. Uh, which books did God write? Okay, we are coming to the word inspired. Very good. So what does inspired mean? God used people to write the books of the Bible. The word Bible means the book. But actually it's a collection of writings. Of writings. I don't say collection of books because some of the books are not very big books. Second John, Third John are not big books. Don't say, let's turn to the book of Second John. There's only one page, half a page. <laughs> right? Some writings. Some of them are big like books. So this collection is a library of different types of writing written by many types of people. Some of the books we don't know who has written it. First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Judges, Ruth. Many, many writings in the Bible. We don't know who the author is. It doesn't matter. It's God's people have written it. And God's people put it together and they have found it inspired. What does that mean? We are going to look at that. Very important for us to realize that the Bible is God's word given to us in human words. Which is the heavenly language? Hebrew, Greek? No. They're all human languages. That's one of the things Christians believe, that God wants to speak to us in our language. That's why Christians have worked very hard to do translation, so that you can read it in, in your vernacular. It's hard work. People have sacrificed their life to spend a whole life sometimes translating the Bible. Because God wants to speak to us in our language. Hebrew and Greek are not some specific kind of holy languages. A lot of people are using it. A lot of people are using it. And God's people also you know, Hebrews, the followers of Abraham and others, they use it. The Bible is God's word, but given to us in human words. There are two things about the Bible. When you read a biblical text, there is a, what we call a historical particularity. So when you're reading Philippians, that is a letter written to the Philippians in the first century. When you're reading Leviticus, it's a book written for the Israelites. You're not an Israelite living in Canaan. And so, uh, when you read Revelation... It was written to a group of people, to them, not to us. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians, he was writing to the Corinthian believers in the first century. Paul does not know you or me. We know him, but he doesn't know you. And the other hand, we believe that the scripture also has eternal relevance. Even though it is written to them, we believe there is eternal relevance. That means we, here in Bangalore, are reading Paul's letter to some other church in Macedonia, Greece. And we say God can speak to us also from that. So what do we do? We do what is called interpretation. We have to keep these two in tension. We cannot forget. Don't read it to say that God is telling me this. Oh, Paul said, you know, you come here and see me in prison. So we are now going to leave Bangalore and go to look for Paul. No, we don't do that. We know that much common sense. That historical particularity, every text was written to a certain group of people, not us, not to us, but in God's providence for us. Are you getting it? Not to us, but for us. But we have to do this difficult task of interpretation, keeping this to in mind. So what is this inspiration? Incarnation. What is incarnation? God became human. And when Jesus was human, did he look like a normal human being or was there some light coming out of his head? <laughs> Just like us. Very human, fully human, with all the limitations of human. So when Jesus was in Galilee, he was not in Jerusalem at the same time. Jesus did all the miracles, not as God, but as a man full of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus did not know everything. You see, once he was going through a crowd and a woman touched him. What did he ask? Who touched me? Was he acting or did he really not know who touched him? He really did not know who touched him. Yeah, he was not acting. Jesus can act. There is a story in Luke 24. After the resurrection, he's walking with those two fellows. And he says, hey, fellows, what are you talking about? What? You don't know anything? What is happening? Yeah? No, no, tell me. You tell me. Oh, they're about Jesus. Of, oh, uh, really? There Jesus is acting. Jesus became fully human. Now, as you read or 2 John 7, some early Christians had a problem with the humanity of Christ. They had difficulty with the humanity of Christ, not divinity. And do you know what they were called in 2 John verse 7? They were called Antichrist. So who's the Antichrist? By the way, you will not find the word Antichrist in the book of Revelation. It's not there. It's only in 1 John and 2 John. They are false teachers. And what is the false teaching? They don't believe in the humanity of Jesus. Now, I want to suggest, as I have written there, similarly, many Christians may struggle with the humanity of the Bible. The Bible is human. We don't believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. No. We believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We follow Jesus. And the Bible helps us to follow Jesus today. Don't say I follow the Bible. There are many things in the Bible you are not following. Don't worry. And you are not supposed to follow that. You are not Israel, for example. The Bible is a collection of writings by God's people which helps us to follow and worship this triune God. So never put the Bible into the Trinity, okay? It never comes at that level, the Bible, even though we call it God's word. So what do you mean by inspiration? And I have explained that there. Yeah, inspiration is not divine dictation. Very important for us to get it. The Islamic understanding of inspiration is it was dictated. Muslims believe in that. We don't. They believe it was dictated. We don't believe the scripture was dictated. God's people wrote it and God inspired. Now what does that mean inspiration? The word inspire is the word breath going in. That's why when somebody dies you call them expire. So inspiration in the second Timothy 3.16 very clearly it says that God breathed or inspired. Now for that, I've given you the reference there, 2.7, Genesis 2.7. We know that story, that's a metaphor. By the way, when we say God's breath, does God have lungs? Hello? No, it's a metaphorical way of speaking about God giving life. Inspiration is only a metaphor for the life-giving nature of the writings that you have. Inspiration is not dictation. God's people wrote the book. And God uses these writings as living, life-giving. Very important for us to get it. The basic principle of interpretation. How do you understand or what is the basic principle of interpretation? Well, please look at me. What is the meaning of this? Out, out. Oh, out. Out where? Ah, so that is only possible if I am the umpire in a cricket field. Will any American ever give me that answer? No, most Americans don't know about cricket. But you see, you are thinking of an Indian, you are a, as an Indian, think about cricket. What else can this be? Look up. Okay, very good. One, very good. What else? God, whatever. Depends. So the meaning is not in this. The meaning is in the context. The meaning is not in this. This can be look to God, can be number one, or if you are empire in a cricket field, out. Where did the meaning come from? Not from this. It came from the context. That is what we need to learn. Jim Jones was a very popular preacher, teacher. People just followed him. He had, was very charismatic. And, uh, but unfortunately, his bad use of scripture, he made more than 900 people in 1978 commit suicide. 
you want to read more about that, go on Wikipedia and read that. Another guy in Waco, Texas, uh, uh, David Koresh, and he also used the scripture such a way, there was a group of people who were around him, and finally the FBI had to come. There was a fire that killed more than 75 people. Now, in other words, these are, of course, extreme cases, extreme examples of people using scripture badly and actually literally killing people. Now, you and I may not kill people by bad use of scripture, but I have a feeling sometimes if we misuse scripture or because we don't understand scripture, we may put people in cages and say, all your life you have to live here. You live, but you live in this cage because we are not using scripture well. So we have to be careful to use scripture because scripture is what? Inspired. What does inspired mean? Life-giving. Not about dictation, it's about life-giving. And if scripture is life-giving, then our use of scripture should bring life to people, not keep them in a cage somewhere. God's people should be free so that they can go and do the work of God. Scripture is life-giving. So that's our task, friends, to work hard at it so that we give the word that is life-giving. And that is the main, main, main point. Uh, at the end of this day, if there is one word you need to remember, it is context. Can you say that after me? Context. Meanings come only in their context. It's not difficult to look at the context in the Bible most times. Okay? So this ABC that you see here, this text, you see it's in this context, but you see it's also in another context, larger context, but you see it's also in another context. That's what we're going to learn. What is this three levels of context? That's what we're going to learn today. And I have used an acronym over the years called AIM. AIM. Any of you have used anything like a gun or a catapult or something, have you? Before you do that, you have to take aim before you shoot. AIM, what does it stand for? I'm using it as an acronym. What does it stand for? Author's intended meaning. That means, I'm the preacher. I'm telling you about Paul. And I'm reading something from Paul. And I say, Paul said this and Paul said that. Everybody says, Amen, Amen, Amen. Everybody is happy, very happy. But when I look, there is one old man sitting at the back. And he's shaking his head. He's shaking his head. Everybody is happy. Why is that old man shaking his head? By the way, I'm using imagination, okay? I hope you can also use imagination. After the service, that old man comes to me and he said, Pastor Jacob, yes, brother. How are you? What is your name? My name is Paul, Apostle Paul. What is he going to say? Why was he shaking his head? He was shaking his head because I kept on saying Paul meant this and Paul said this and everything about Paul. He says, Illa, that is not what I said. No, no, no. Why can't this pastor read his Bible, man? What is wrong with this Jacob? Why can't he read his Bible? He's only reading one verse and he's shouting. You see, when you preach from Paul, make sure that Paul will clap for you. Not your people. They will clap also. Are you really representing Paul well? Author's intended meaning. So whoever is writing, you have to work hard to find out what that author meant, not what you think at that point. Right? Isn't that fair? You're reading Paul's letter. You should understand what he meant. Secondly, remember, he wrote to an audience. What did the audience understand? Audience is inducted, meaning ask that question. The original audience, the book or writing was for that audience. Revelation was not written to us, for example. It was written to the first century to a group of Christians who were being persecuted and some of them would die. What do you write to them? You have a specific message to them, not to us 21st century people. None of us is afraid we'll die tomorrow. None of us in our, our pastors tell our people, now if any of you dies by persecution this week, don't worry, we will bury you. You don't say that because that fear is not there. But the message of revelation was to that church. So what did they understand? We have to ask that. Audiences, inducted meaning. So can you say, say that words after me? Authors, intended meaning. A-I-M. Audiences, inducted meaning. 
This is the basic principle of interpretation. Context, ask questions. What did the original author mean? Right? Now, what I did was I summarized um, in 50 minutes what we have done in the last four hours, in the last few sessions. But that was specially for you. Is that okay? Are you with me till now? Okay. Do you all agree that the basic principle makes sense? For example, if I say, let's say I'm a nice man and you come into my house and I will say, don't worry, we will take care of you. You know, or you are a new student comes into SABC and we welcome him and say, don't worry, we will take care of you. You understand what I mean. But what if I'm a mafia don? Okay? And you walk into in front of me and I say, don't worry, we will take care of you. And then I tell my sidekick, I said the same words. Does it mean the same? No. The context decides the meaning. Not the text. Not the Bible verse. The context. So, that's a litmus test, friends. You know, in chemistry, there's a simple test called litmus test. Uh, our children will tell us what it is if you, if you have forgotten. Because you studied this in middle school, you forgot it. But you ask your children, they will tell you what is litmus test. It is a test. Just you put that paper in, the color change will tell you whether the solution is acidic or alkaline. That's it. So, if you are saying the meaning of this is this, put that. Okay, so did the first century people understand that? Ille. Is this about computers? You read something in Revelation, you say it is about computers. Interesting. So the first century people understood about computers? No. So then that cannot be the meaning of that text. Problematic, I know. But that's basic common sense. That's the basic principle. We cannot break this principle ever. Because we always tell people when we are arguing, Are you did not mean, I was not talking about that. You took me out of context. Correct? Meanings always come from the context. <laughs>